Chapter 13, Diversity of Microbes, Fungi, and Protists. The chapter is broken up into four different sections. Prokaryotic diversity is by far the longest. Eukaryotic origins is the shortest. And then we'll get some information on protists and different types of fungi. We're going to see incredibly variable and wonderfully complex organisms in this chapter. You might find that it's helpful to do some simple sketches along the way. Let's begin with prokaryotic diversity, which is intense because they're found basically everywhere, in and on everything, as long as there's a little bit of moisture. And they tend to be very helpful because they can recycle nutrients and turn things from an unusable form back into a usable form, supporting the rest of the life forms on our Earth. They often also commonly drive evolution, and that's because they have the ability to kind of bestow advantageous features on the creatures with which they live. DNA sequencing has allowed us to classify prokaryotic diversities with far more confidence than we used to be able to, and there's a whole lot of diversity because they spent a good portion of their time on Earth being the only creatures here. Earth has undergone about 4.54 billion years of evolution, and in early Earth, there wasn't any oxygen. So phototrophs were simply using sunlight to create usable energy without that carbon cycle, or excuse me, Calvin cycle that we are used to. Cyanobacteria eventually evolved from these simple phototrophs about 1 billion years later using carbon dioxide and slowly pumping our atmosphere full of oxygen. So the first organisms to develop on Earth had to deal with a lot of radiation on Earth's surface. We didn't have much of an atmosphere, which nowadays helps to filter out dangerous radiation that comes in from our cosmic background and also the solar flares from the sun. So a lot of them developed underground, uh, really deep under the surfaces, near volcanoes, and deep underwater in the oceans. Hot springs in Yellowstone National Park can kind of show you what early earth conditions might have looked like because these springs are so incredibly hot that they have really high concentrations of solutions like, or excuse me, elements like sulfur and methane gases, which we don't always see. So the cells that live in them are more similar to the cells that were around at the early, the earlier part of our Earth's evolution than what we would find floating in the oceans today. Microbial mats may represent some of the earliest life forms on Earth. We have fossil evidence for them existing about 3.5 billion years ago. They formed a large biofilm. It was a few centimeters thick, multi-layered sheet of prokaryotes that typically grew on moist surfaces. They held themselves together with a gummy-like substance that they all kind of secreted in mass. They obtained their energy, we think, from hydro hydrothermal vents, which are just fissures in the Earth's surface that release geothermally heated water. So water that was heated um, towards the core of the Earth, or not necessarily towards the core, but thanks to magma under the Earth's crust. Nowadays, we can look at some, some things created by these early prokaryotes, like those in stromatolites. Stromatolites are formed when, minimal, when minerals are precipitated out from water due to the actions of prokaryotes that live in microbial mats, so they pull the minerals out and concentrate them. Stromatolites form as layered rocks made out of carbonate or silicate, and there are actually places on Earth where stromatolites are still forming, and they make some absolutely beautiful caves. Here's an example of some microbial mats over on the left-hand side and stromatolites on the right-hand side. So while most of them are quite old, we can find them in places where they're still actively growing, like on the beaches near San Francisco. Bacteria and archaea that grow under extreme conditions are known as the extremophiles. They live really deep in the oceans, in those hot springs we saw earlier, on the poles, very dry places, very deep places, very harsh places, places with high radiation environments. We tend to study these extremophiles because they have characteristics and produce chemicals to combat some really dangerous environments, and it turns out that a lot of those abilities are helpful as therapeutic drugs or they have various industrial applications. We also tend to study extremophiles because if we find life on a planet that's not quite as life friendly as Earth, they're probably going to look closer to those extremophiles than the typical bacteria that we hear about. 
Most prokaryotes fall into these three basic shapes. We're going to start talking about kind of basic prokaryotic characteristics. In A, you can see cocci, they're just spherical shaped. Some bacteria are bacilli or rod shaped, and then we have the spirilia or spiral shaped or corkscrew shaped bacteria. Everybody kind of falls in these three categories. When it comes to prokaryotic cells, they share some features with the eukaryotes that we've been studying. They all have plasma membranes. They all have a cytoplasm. They've all got some sort of genetic material, DNA or RNA, and then they all have ribosomes where we spend time making our proteins. Let's look a little more closely at your typical prokaryote. They're unicellular, they lack organelles. They have one single chromosome as just a really long piece of DNA that's kept kind of packaged in a little area, but it's not surrounded by anything protective. So that, that kind of packaged area of DNA is known as the nucleoid. Many have cell walls that lay outside of their plasma membrane. Those walls look a little different in bacteria and archaea, and we'll get to that. They're usually a protective layer and help give the organism its shape. Some of them have capsules, which allow them to attach to surfaces and kind of give them a little bit of added protection from dehydration. Flagella are used for locomotion. There are pili, which are also kind of attachment vesicles, and they can actually attach to other bacteria for undergoing conjugation, which is the sharing of genetic information. So actually you can use pili to kind of build a bridge between themselves and a cell that's near them. Finally, in this picture we point out, or not in this picture, but on the slide, we point out plasmids. These are extra little circular pieces of DNA outside of the main chromosome. We tend to find plasmids in many species of bacteria. So I mentioned archaea before. Both bacteria and archaea are types of prokaryotic cells. They tend to differ in the lipid concentration of their cell membranes. Their cell walls, though, do share the same basic structures. They just have different chemical components. When we study these chemical components, we get some evidence of the ancient separation of their lineages. So they did come from the same common ancestor, but it was just a long, long, long time ago. So we can see some, some interesting features in the two of them that are the same and some pretty interesting features that are quite different. So a little bit more about that cell wall. It's a protective layer that gives the cell shape and rigidity. It can also help prevent osmotic lysis. It can uh, kind of balance out big water changes. When we talk about bacterial cell walls, we focus a lot on a chemical called peptic lidocaine. It's composed of polysaccharide chains that are linked to peptides. Cell walls can either be gram positive or gram negative, and that is just a reference, again, to that peptic lidocaine. Gram-positive cell walls have really thick layers of the peptic lidocaine, while those that are gram-negative have few layers of it, but they have additional structures that help to build up their cell walls, and they tend to also be surrounded by another outer membrane. Archaeal cell walls, they don't have any of this peptic lidocaine. We tend to group archaeal cell walls into four major categories. I have them grouped into two here just for simplicity's sake. One major category are archaeal cells that have a pseudopeptic lidocaine, so it kind of looks like it, but when you study the molecular structure, it's not true peptic lidocaine. And then groups two, three, and four all contain polysaccharides, glycoproteins, and surface layer proteins that we call S layer proteins. It's really not necessary that you know all the fancy stuff about those, but just know that archaeal cell walls do not contain peptoglycan, but there's not one cell wall that defines them all. Here's what that looks like if you're having kind of a hard time with the gram positive and gram negative. So for gram positive, it just means that they can pick up a, a gram stain. They show a negative test with gram staining. So they have a nice thick layer of peptoglycan outside of their plasma membrane. For gram-negative bacteria, they have an inner membrane, a peptoglycan layer, and then an outer membrane. Prokaryotic diversity continues in your book to talk about reproduction, but more so all the different ways that prokaryotes can share genetic information. Because when they reproduce, it's primarily asexual, and it takes place via binary fission, which we've already studied. But 
prokaryotes can get new genetic information. There's a few different ways to do that. One of them is called transformation, and that's when a cell takes DNA found in its environment. So the DNA came from a different prokaryote. That prokaryote, prokaryote can either be alive or dead, and your current living cell can actually take it up. There are really interesting examples of this where a pathogen has died and the dead pathogen can pass its bacteria on to a living cell that normally wouldn't cause diseases and a bacteria that used to be safe or at least harmless can now cause illness. There's a process called transduction where it's kind of the same idea but instead of DNA being passed bacteria to bacteria, the DNA actually comes from a virus that has infected bacteria. The last kind of DNA sharing mechanism we'll discuss is called conjugation. And it's when DNA is transferred from one prokaryote to another by those pillis, those pili. So they build little bridges between one another. They open up the connection between the pili and they can pass useful plasmids back and forth to one another. This is how things like antibiotic resistance get shared. Just a reminder, binary fission can be very rapid. It only takes a few minutes. So we have all kind of the necessary ingredients to ensure really rapid evolutionary change in prokaryotes when the need arises. Antibiotic resistance is something really important to note when we start talking about prokaryotes. Your book goes into a bit of a tangent about essentially the history of human disease. I think it's more important for us in this class to remember uh, the lessons that we know from antibiotic resistance. Antibiotics are, they're everywhere. People take them all the time. People give them to animals. They're in our water now. It's in the water shed. The, someone's not putting them in your water on purpose. But what's happening when we expose ourselves to antibiotics that we don't need is that we kill off all of the weak bacteria and we only allow the strong to survive and that drives evolution because the only bacteria who live are the bacteria who can't be killed by an antibiotic. So then when you get infected by a bacteria that can't be killed by an antibiotic, you obviously have a really bad day. That's what MRSA is. When you hear of methylacillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA, that was essentially driven by human evolution. We kept overdosing people with antibiotics or inappropriately dosing people with antibiotics so they wouldn't finish a course of medication or they bugged their doctor for antibiotics to help them get over a cold, which doesn't work. We killed off all the good bacteria, we killed off all the weak bacteria, and we left no competition for the crazy dangerous bacteria. So the moral of the story is do not take antibiotics unless you absolutely need them. Antibiotics do nothing for viral infections. They should never be shared and they should always, always, always be completed to the very last pill to ensure that you don't have a few resistant bacteria left in your body and you just created a perfect breeding, breeding ground with no competition. To continue on prokaryotic diversity, foodborne disease is actually something that we look at with prokaryotes because a lot of it results from contamination results uh, contamination that came from pathogenic bacteria, viruses, or other parasites. A lot of characteristics of foodborne illness have changed over time as we've learned about the benefits of sanitation. Botulism used to be pretty common. It was produced by an anaerobic bacteria that loved living inside canned goods. Uh, now it tends to be linked to produce contaminated by animal, animal waste. So uh, when creatures are crawling all over crates when food is in storage ready to be shipped or hiding in semi-trailers or you know wherever an animal might go to the bathroom on your food and then your food is not appropriately clean before it's given to you. All types of food can potentially become contaminated with harmful bacteria for a variety of different species. A lot of the times we're looking at vegetables or foods that are kept wet through a long part of their processing because it just kind of encourages that bacterial growth, but it's something to consider when you're looking at prokaryotic diversity. Here's some examples. These are sprouts. In case you've never eaten sprouts, sprouts really easily carry E. coli. It's a, been a problem here in the States and it's definitely been a problem for the folks at Chipotle.
please don't be scared of prokaryotes. Some of them are absolutely wonderful. Some of the products from prokaryotes are some of my favorite foods in the whole wide world, like cheese, salami, and yogurt. Not a huge fan of fish sauce personally, but prokaryotes can be very helpful. One of the best things that prokaryotes can do for us is help us to clean up our environment through a process called bioremediation. Prokaryotes have been found that can eat oil and break it down into less harmful substances. Prokaryotes can eat gas. Gasoline, if you spill gasoline in a field, you can add prokaryotes to clean up the environment. Prokaryotes can clean certain types of chemical spills, sulfur spills. We're finding that there are a lot of helpful little microorganisms out there, and if we use them to our advantage, we can correct some of the things that we have done to our environment. On that note, I'm actually going to end this video for part one because this chapter is a bit lengthy.